We're going to look at Jesus' first sermon this morning. Mark chapter 1 and verse number 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Here a few Sunday nights ago we talked about how Jesus' first public sermon, the first word out of his mouth was, Repent. The first word of John the Baptist's recorded preaching was, Repent. The apostles preached a gospel that was repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the call to repentance was ringing throughout the theme of Jesus' entire ministry and that of his apostles. And it was how Jesus even described himself. Remember when he rebuked the Pharisees, he told them, he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It was Jesus who stood before the multitude in Luke 13 and declared, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now that's not a fashionable 21st century message. To preach a gospel that demands repentance, however, was no more fashionable in the first century than it was or is in the 21st. And you want an illustration of that? John the Baptist lost his head. Jesus ended up on a cross. All 12 of Jesus' apostles ended up basically dying for the faith. 11 of them were martyred and Judas hung himself. But from his first message to his last, Jesus was calling sinners to repentance. And this meant not only that they gained a new perspective on who he was, but that they turned from their sin and from their self and followed him. And of course, the message that our Lord commands us to preach is the same. And so for the last few weeks, I've been thinking about this thought, what is, what is repentance? Repentance is a critical element of salvation. Without it, there is no salvation. And so we have to nail this down. In other words, there are some preachers that they say, well, repentance is simply another word for believing. No, it's not. I mean, there's a reason why the Bible uses different words, because different words mean different things. In the Greek word, that word repentance, it's metanoia. It comes from meta, which means after. And noia, which means to understand. So literally, it's like to understand after, or an afterthought, if you will. Or a change of mind. In other words, you were thinking a certain way on something, and then... After the fact, you reconsider and you're like, you know what, I think, you know. But the biblical meaning goes even deeper than that. Because not only in the Bible does repentance refer to a change of mind, but it also refers to a change of purpose. Which is why repentance is usually in the context of sin. In other words, you're turning from it. In the sense that Jesus called for repentance in the sense that John the Baptist called for repentance. It was a repudiation of the old life and a turning to God for salvation. And it was always a singular action. So when Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel, he wasn't saying to do two different things. They were the same thing. Because the two are intertwined. In other words, they were two, maybe you could consider them two steps to a singular action. And this was the change of purpose that the apostle had in mind when he preached repentance. When he told the Thessalonians to repent, they turned to God from their idols to serve the true and the living God. And so turning from the idols and turning to God were not two separate things. They were one and the same. If anything, maybe you see three elements there. There's a turning to God, but at the same time, that was a turning from evil. So they were one and the same thing. And their intent, the reason they turned from the evil and to God was because they intended to serve him. And so all three of those things were really one act. And so no change of mind can be called repentance unless it also changes the purpose and the action. In other words, 
our change of thought should result in a change of action. That's why John the Baptist, when they came for baptism, he said, well, you know, show me some fruit in your life that shows me that you've repented. In other words, you say you've repented. You say you have a change of mind on this subject. So now when I can see that in your life, come talk to me. And so repentance is more than a mere shame or sorrow for sin. I interviewed a celebrity on my radio show last week. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you who it was. It was John Schneider. And he said that there are so many people that say, I did such and such, and I've repented of this, and by the blood of Christ, I'll never do this again. And he said, that's a bunch of, and I won't say the word he used. He said, I've sinned, and darn it, I'm going to do it again, and by the blood of Christ, he'll forgive me when I do it again, just like he did it this last time. You say, well, well there's no repentance there. And... But he said this, he said, he said, the repentance is in the fact of, he said, the first time I did it, I did it intentionally. He said, the next time I do it, he goes, I'm going to do it. He goes, it's not going to be intentional. He said, it's just going to be the fact that I'm, I'm a flawed person and I've stumbled. He said, and, and, and that's where, it, at least in his thinking, the repentance came, came in. Because the next time he does it, he's, didn't intend to do it. Repentance is literally a redirection of the will. It's a purposeful decision to forsake the unrighteous and to pursue righteousness instead. And so we don't always succeed in that, but the intention will show some, some fruit in our life, some action. Because repentance is not a human work. In other words, like every other aspect of salvation, repentance is given to us by God. David, in the Psalms, he prayed that God would grant him repentance. For several chapters, we see David praying that God would grant him repentance. And, and we read of David uh, just mourning and weeping and fasting and asking God for repentance. Finally, in Psalm chapter 51, God gives it to him. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 11, the apostles are praying that God would grant to the Gentiles repentance that leads to eternal life. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth was the Apostle Paul's exact prayer. And so if God gives repentance, it's not entirely a human work. Because remember, we're not saved by works. Ephesians 2 tells us we're saved by grace through faith and not of works. And so, I mean, we, we can't even muster up enough faith to save ourselves. God has to give us the faith. And Ephesians 2 says it's the gift of God. And so God has to give us the faith. And similarly, God gives us repentance because it's not of ourselves. So repentance isn't just a pre-salvation attempt to put your life in order or to turn over a new leaf. Repentance is not a command to make your sins right so that you can be saved. Repentance is is recognizing your lawlessness and hating it and turning your back on it and fleeing to Jesus and embracing him. True repentance involves self-reproach. It involves contrition. It involves shame. It involves godly sorrow over one's sin. And all those things are impossible with a hard heart. And so the very fact that we're able to repent means that the Holy Spirit is already working on us and softening us. But it's also not just a mental activity. It involves the intellect, the emotions, the will. Intellectually, repentance begins with recognizing our sin. In other words, we understand that we're sinners. That our sin is an affront to a holy God, and more precisely, that we're personally responsible for our own guilt. The repentance that leads to salvation starts in the intellect, and it begins with a recognition of sin, but it also leads to salvation which is a recognition of who Jesus is, along with the understanding of his right to govern our lives. In other words, emotionally, genuine repentance, it, it accompanies the overwhelming sense of sorrow. But the sorrow alone is not repentance. In other words, you can be sorry for your sin and not repent. Maybe you're sorry for the consequences. Maybe you're even genuinely sorry for the consequences that happen in somebody else's life because of it. Maybe you're sorry that you got caught. 
Judas, for example, felt so much remorse for his sin that he went out and hung himself. But that was not repentance. The rich young ruler in Matthew 19 and verse 22 went away sorrowful, but that was not repentance. Sorrow can lead to repentance. Sorrow, according to the will of God, 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, does produce repentance. But true, repentance is so much more than sorrow for getting caught or sadness because of the consequence. It's literally a sense of anguish that we've sinned against a holy God. Which is why in the Old Testament, when they repented, they often wore sackcloth and ashes. In other words, the symbols of mourning. And so biblical repentance involves a change of direction. It involves a transformation of the will. It's not just a change of mind, but a determination to abandon stubborn disobedience and surrender our will to God. And so as a result, genuine repentance will inevitably result in a change of behavior. That behavior change is not repentance, but it's the fruit of repentance. Does it take place at conversion? Yes. But it's a progressive, lifelong process. It's an active, continuous attitude of repentance of Jesus talked about it in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you know, he talked about the meek. He talked about the poor in spirit. That's that lifetime of repentance, if you will. And it's the mark of the true believer. And so when Jesus preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, those who, understood, those who heard him, they understood the message. Because... In the Old Testament, in the rabbinical teachings, there was a clear message of repentance and his hearers would not have been confused about the meaning of repentance. They knew he was calling for more than just a change of mind or a new perspective. In other words, in a lot of our preaching today, we try to downplay repentance because people don't want to hear that kind of preaching. So you have a lot of preachers and pastors and churches and teachers that they're redefining repentance. They're dumbing it down, if you will. Oh, repentance is just another word for believe, or repentance just means to change your mind. But it's more than that. And the audience Jesus preached to understood that. In other words, it was a new way of life. It wasn't just coming to a different opinion, but he was calling on them not only to admit their sin, but to turn from it, to literally turn around, not just in their thinking, but also in their living, and to forsake their sin and selfishness and to follow him. Because by the time Jesus was preaching, the Jewish concept of repentance was well developed. The rabbis, for example, had held that Isaiah 1, verses 16 and 17, described nine activities that led to repentance. Isaiah said, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And so there's a progression there. It begins internally with cleansing. And then it manifests itself in attitudes and actions. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, a passage of scripture that we quote all the time. But it was a key text of repentance. Although we see it in the realm of patriotism. And that is if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and will heal their land. And so it was a call to repentance. In other words, God promised a blessing, but the blessing required a change of, of thought that would result in a change of action. And so when we humble ourselves and we turn from our wicked ways and to God, and then God heals and God blesses. And so without even using the word, it was an Old Testament call to repentance. In Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and God will have compassion on him and God will abundantly pardon. In Jonah chapter 3, how did God determine that the repentance of Nineveh was, ge was genuine? By their deeds. John the Baptist, how did he determine that people had truly repented? Again, by the change he saw in their lives. And so when the Pharisees came, he turned them away because there was nothing about their behavior that indicated repentance. And so the Jewish understanding of repentance was far clearer in the first century than the evangelical and fundamentalist understanding of repentance is in the 21st. And the difference is, is in the first century, if 
Repentance was genuine. You saw productive, observable results. You saw the fruits of repentance. You saw people who had genuinely repented. You knew they did because they lived righteously along with their change of mind and attitude was a change in conduct. It was radical. And so repentance has always been the foundation of the New Testament call to salvation. Remember on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And so no message that eliminates repentance can be called the gospel, for sinners cannot come to Jesus apart from a radical change of the heart and the mind and the will. A spiritual crisis, if you will, leading to a complete turnaround. And I think that's why the tax collectors and the prostitutes were saved before the Pharisees were. The Pharisees lived under the delusion that God approved of them because they made a great show of their religion. But the problem was that it was just a show. They claimed that they loved God and they kept his law. But yet the Pharisees were like a lot of people today. They say they believe in Jesus, but they refuse to obey him. Their professions were hollow. And so Jesus told him, he said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Jesus wasn't talking to the Pharisees and the prostitutes when he preached that. He was talking to the religious crowd. The tax collectors and the prostitutes had an easier time than the Pharisees in getting saved because the tax collectors and the prostitutes understood that they were sinners. They saw themselves as sinners and so they could repent. They could turn from that. On the other hand, the most impressive of Pharisees basically sheltered his sin by refusing to acknowledge it. And so you can't repent from something that you don't even recognize. There's no salvation apart from repentance and faith. And so Jesus said, I, he said, the whole need not a physician. The whole reason the prostitutes and the tax collectors were coming to him was because they were sick. They knew they needed a doctor. There are many today who respond to an invitation, but their positive response to Jesus is not enough to save them. You want an illustration of that? Look at the rich young ruler. His was a positive response to Jesus, but yet he went away sorrowful. Nicodemus in John chapter 3, I think Nicodemus got saved at some point because at the end of Jesus' life, it was Nicodemus who claimed his crucified body, took it to the tomb. But I don't believe he got saved that night that he talked to Jesus in John chapter 3. He responded positively. I mean, he came. He came to Jesus and said, hey, you know, you're a teacher who comes from God. You know, talk to me. But what's the difference between those who have a positive response and those who are genuinely born again? The difference is repentance. John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to a woman at the well. And she says, give me that living water that I might not have to draw from this well again. Now, that was a positive response to Jesus. You know what most churches would have done? They would have said, okay, pray this prayer. Fill out this card. Here's your offering envelopes. From now on, we're going to refer to you as Sister Woman at the Well. And she'll come to church for a few months, maybe even a few years. And then she'll quit. You say, well, why will she quit? Because this whole religion thing didn't work out for her. It didn't do anything for her. You say, well, why not? Because she was never genuinely born again. You say, well, why not? She made a decision for Jesus, but she had never repented. And so there was no true conversion. There was no true salvation. And so she says, hey, give me this living water. I want it. And so Jesus didn't say, oh, God, got me another one here. No, what was his response to that? He did the one thing that probably no pastor, no preacher would do with someone like her having just walked the aisle. He says, oh, oh by the way, we have one more thing we need to talk about, and that's the fact that, that you're living in adultery. You know, that's the fact that you're shacked up with some guy who's not your husband. So why, why would she's ready to make the commitment, she's ready to fill out the decision card, she's, she's positively responding to the message, she wants the living water, why does Jesus bring up the ugly subject of her sin? Because repentance is a necessary element of faith. And without repentance, there's no faith. And so, Father, I thank you that our Lord Jesus has come so that we can repent. Pray that we would see the need for repentance in our lives. Pray 
that if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you as their Savior in true repentance and faith, pray that this afternoon as we're eating lunch, as we're talking, as we're fellowshipping, that they'll make that known and so that I can take the Bible and just show them how they can know 100% for sure that Jesus is their Savior, that repentance and faith are not complicated things and hard to find, but easy to find. And pray, Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here that needs to find them this morning, that you'll help them to do so. We ask it in your name. Amen.